Good afternoon, and on behalf of the Supreme Court Fellows Alumni Association, I'm pleased to welcome you to the 11th Annual Supreme Court Fellows Program Panel Discussion. My name is Bob Dealing, and I'm a former fellow and the current president of the Fellows Alumni Association. The Supreme Court Fellows Program was founded by Chief Justice Warren Berger in 1973, and it now enables four talented individuals each year to contribute to the work of the judicial branch by working at the Supreme Court, the Federal Judicial Center, the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, or the U.S. Sentencing Commission. The Fellows Program and its alumni sponsor this event each year to focus attention on a particularly timely or provocative issue in the administration of justice. We are particularly honored this year and grateful that Georgetown University Law Center is co-sponsoring this program with us, which falls on the 35th anniversary of the Supreme Court Fellows Program. It is even a greater honor for all of us that the program today features two of the most distinguished jurists in the world, Baroness Brenda M. Hale and Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Their remarks today will focus on comparative issues related to the British and United States legal systems. In order to provide context for their conversation and remarks, however, our program will begin with an overview of the recent creation of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom to be presented by Dean Alexander Alenikoff of the Georgetown University Law School. The Dean will also introduce Baroness Hale and Justice Ginsburg, and he will serve as the moderator for their conversation. On behalf of the Fellows Program, thank you for joining us today, and please join me in welcoming Dean Alenikoff. Thank you. Well, Georgetown is delighted to be co-sponsoring this event and to have our distinguished guests with us for what will be surely an, an interesting discussion. Um, I do want to introduce our two guests and then say a little bit about recent uh, changes in the, in the UK uh, legal system. Uh, in 2004, the Right Honorable, the Baroness Hale of Richmond, uh, became the first woman law lord in the British House of Lords, which is the highest appellate tribunal in the United Kingdom. In 2005, the United Kingdom adopted constitutional reforms that will transfer the appellate powers of the House of Lords to a new Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. This will take place in late 2009, and Lady Hale will become one of the first justices of the new Supreme Court. Prior to becoming a law lord, Lady Hale served on the Court of Appeal, which is the highest appellate court and division of the Supreme Court of England and Wales, and prior to that, she was on the High Court, which is the lower court division of the Supreme Court of England and Wales. This will all become clear to you by the end of the hour and a half here. <laughs> in 1984, she became the youngest person and first woman ever appointed to the Law Commission, which is a statutory body in the United Kingdom that is charged with the responsibility uh, of reviewing and recommending changes in the law. And as a member of the Law Commission, Lady Hale actively pursued legal reforms in the area of family law. She served as a barrister and was appointed to Queen's Council in 1989. And Lady Hale has taught at Manchester University and is a recognized scholar in human rights and family law. She studied law at Girton College, Cambridge, and graduated at the top of her class. So too did Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She was appointed to the Supreme Court of the United States in 1993 by President Bill Clinton. From 1980 to 1993, she'd served as a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. Like Lady Hale, Justice Ginsburg was a star undergraduate student graduating first in her class from Cornell University. And following her graduation from Cornell, she enrolled in the Harvard Law School and later transferred and graduated from Columbia Law School. These are schools to the north of here somewhere. <laughs> also like Lady Hale, following law school, Justice Ginsburg had a teaching career at Columbia Law School and Rutgers Law School. Throughout her career, she's been a leader in the field of women's rights, serving as the first director of the ACLU's Women Rights Project in 1972 and as general counsel of the ACLU from 1973 to 1980. 
In her position at the ACLU, Justice Ginsburg argued six landmark cases before the United States Supreme Court, where now, of course, she decides the cases. Welcome to both of you. Let me say a brief word about, uh, about change uh, in the legal system of the United Kingdom, and Lady Hale has already informed me that she stands ready to correct any mistake I make up here on this matter. The United Kingdom, made up of England and Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland, has no unified national court system as the United States does uh, with our federal judiciary. Most appeals from the independent court systems of the uh, constituent countries are taken to the House of Lords in Parliament, which has an appellate committee comprised of law lords who are also members of the House of Lords. And that is where Lady Hale currently serves as a law lord in the House of Lords. The Constitutional Reform Act of 2005 calls for the transfer of judicial powers from the Appellate Committee in the House of Lords to a new Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. This transfer will take place in 2009 upon completion of the renovation of Middlesex Guildhall, which will serve as the home of the new court. The primary goal of the transformation is to enhance judicial independence and separation of powers, although the Appellate Committee of the House of Lords has operated as a de facto independent Supreme Court of the United Kingdom without the statutory and physical separation that the new arrangements will bring about. The structural changes of the Constitutional Reform Act, therefore, are designed to formalize the independence and create an identifiable source of power in the United Kingdom. Now, notably, the new Supreme Court of the United Kingdom will not necessarily expand its powers to be commensurate with those of uh, constitutional courts in Canada and Australia or the U.S. Supreme Court. The appellate jurisdiction of the new U.K. Supreme Court uh, will remain substantially the same as it did in the House of Lords with very limited judicial review. And this is a topic we'll pursue uh, in the questions in a few moments. The new Supreme Court will have 12 justices. Ours, of course, has nine. And the first 12 justices will be the existing law lords who will be called justices, although they will remain members of the House of Lords. New justices added once the court is created will no longer be members of the House of Lords. The Queen will appoint the justices upon the recommendation of the Prime Minister after a newly created Judicial Selection Commission makes a recommendation based on a merit review process. Now, this, compare this to the way we do things in the United States. The Judicial Selection Commission will be made up of the President and Deputy President of the Supreme Court of the UK, one member from each of the Judicial Appointments Commissions of England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And it must further consult with senior judges, the Lord Chancellor, and other executives. The justices will have security of tenure removable uh, on the address of both houses of parliament, although there will be a mandatory retirement age at age 75. Uh, there is no mandatory retirement age, of course, for the U.S. Supreme Court. These raise all sorts of interesting comparative questions about judicial independence, judicial review, new buildings and titles. And so let's get right to our discussion. I'll ask questions for a bit of time, and then we will turn to questions uh, from the audience. Excuse me for walking. Perhaps I could ask each justice to begin with a, uh, a brief description or discussion of the importance of the role of judicial independence uh, in their particular uh, uh, legal systems and the role that the highest court in the land plays in preserving judicial independence. Justice Ginsburg, can I start with you? In the United States, I think we have various models of court systems. The federal system, the judges who serve that system are blessed by life tenure. We hold our offices during good behavior. <laughs> so uh, all of my colleagues behave very well. <laughs> <laughs> and we do have tremendous job security. We, we have no compulsory retirement age. If I were on the new UK Supreme Court, I would be gone before the court begins operations because I will become 75 this year. Our oldest justice is 87. 
But the federal system is not the only judicial system in the United States, and most of our states elect their judges at some level. Now you think about how that can be compatible with judicial independence if you are required to run for election periodically. And I won't say more about that now because I think we want to hear in the main from Baroness Hale. Lady Hale. Well, almost exactly the same in the sense that all the higher judiciary in the United Kingdom are also appointed during good behavior. Quam do you say Benny Gesserint? If you all understand. Uh, uh, that was the guarantee of judicial independence that was introduced in, under the Act of Settlement of 1701. And as I understand it, one of the grievances of the American colonies was that the colonial judges were not appointed with that degree of independence. And it's one of the things that you wanted to introduce on independence, that you had the same, your higher judiciary had the same independence that ours did. Seems like a good idea. So when I was sworn in as a member of the House of Lords, I was sworn in to hold office as a Lord of Appeal in ordinary, so long as she shall well behave herself therein. <laughs> It caused exactly the same laughter in the House of Lords <laughs> as it has caused in this room because the ordinary parliamentarian who was sworn in as an ordinary life member of the House of Lords at the same time as I was had no obligation to behave himself. <laughs> uh, and you will no doubt be aware of certain famous members of the House of Lords, um, one of whom has recently been convicted of certain crimes in this country. Um, who have raised the question as to whether it should be possible uh, to remove peerages from people who haven't behaved so well. Um, it's the same guarantee of independence. The fact that we have a retirement age, um, I think it was introduced because there were certain judges in particularly the High Court and the Court of Appeal who went on long beyond it was sensible for them to go on, but were not sufficiently incompetent to be removed uh, by an address by both Houses of Parliament to Her Majesty. So I think that's why it was introduced. Uh, and then, of course, there was a great uh, passion for having youth on the bench. So they needed to get rid of the old in order to make younger people uh, room for younger people to be appointed to the bench. And so the uh, uh, retirement age came down from 75 to 70 for most of the, the judiciary. Um, now, of course, they're wondering whether that's quite such a good idea and maybe it's better because we're all getting so much older that we better stay in office being useful instead of having big pensions for ages when we're not being useful. Uh, but I, I don't think judicial independence in terms of the ability of the judges to make up their own minds without fear or favor, affection or ill will, what the result of a particular case is, is under threat in my country. I don't think it is in that sense. The threats come from the lack of resources for the court system. I don't know whether it's the same in this country, but that's the problem for judicial independence with us. Um, may, may please. I just interrupt this serious discussion with a couple of questions that I so much would like to ask Baroness Hale. And the first is, you spent much of your life as Professor Hale, as Brenda Hale, and now you are Baroness Hale of Richmond. How did you select your title, or was it given to you? <laughs> that's, the, that's the first part. The second part is, you are a Lord of Appeal in ordinary. Is there any Lord of Appeal extraordinary? <laughs> and, and, and the third, and this is the, the last one. The, the custom in England was to address a judge, my lord. And I know about Lady Elizabeth Butler Schloss and the problem she had with being called my lord. So how are you addressed. Ah, right. One, when you become a member of the House of Lords, you have to have a, new, a unique name. You cannot have the same name as any other 
uh, member of the House of Lords, unless you're a hereditary peer, when of course you have to have the same name <laughs> as the one from whom you inherited and the one from whom he inherited and so on. So I couldn't be just Lady Hale because there had already been a peer called Hale. No relation. Um, and in fact, he was a life peer who was dead, but apparently the um, same rule applies. <laughs> so I had either to find myself a new surname, um, <laughs> which you can do. I mean, there was a chap called Sir Christopher Prout, who was our ambassador in Brussels, and so, well, to the European Union, so it was uniformly known as Brussels Sprout. <laughs> So when he became a member of the House of Lords, and he's in fact the Shadow Lord Chancellor, um, he decided he'd call himself Lord Kingsland. <laughs> Much better name. So, but I didn't want to lose my name because I'd already changed my name twice in my life and I thought, you know, three times was going to be too much. Um, so you, then what you do is call yourself of somewhere. Now the Richmond down the road from here is a very recent creation. But it is named after a town in the north of England called Richmond, which is the town where I grew up. It's a very, very beautiful town with a medieval ruined castle, cobbled marketplace, etc., etc. It's got everything historic. Do come and visit it one of these days. So I decided that I would be called Hale of Richmond. Uh, so that's answer number one. <laughs> Lords of. Lords of Appeal in Ordinary, yes. Well, when originally the Judicial House of Lords was staffed by the Lord Chancellor, former Lord Chancellors, and anybody else who happened to be a member of the House of Lords who had held high judicial office. But there weren't enough of those to handle all the work um, by the second half of the uh, 19th century. And after a lot of debate about whether they should abolish us, abolish the judicial work of the House of Lords, which one might get on to about this question of what's the role of a second-tier appeal court. Um, they decided, no, the right solution was actually to have specialist lawyers appointed, mirabilu dictu, as life peers. And they invented this title for them, Lords of Appeal in Ordinary. And the in ordinary means that we are paid. <laughs> the ordinary are our rations. The other members of the House of Lords are not paid. I imagine your senators are paid. <laughs> well, ours aren't. Um, and uh, so that, we don't have any Lords of Appeal extraordinary because that would mean that they wouldn't get paid. And they wouldn't like that. So that's number two, wasn't it? The Lord. Um, then how we're addressed. I can tell you that I think one of the biggest debates that we will have when we go into the new Supreme Court is how we will be addressed. Um, because our magistrates are addressed as your worship, our circuit judges are addressed as your honour, and the high court and above are addressed as my lord or my lady. So I'm sure we're going to have some debate as to whether we stick with the my lord and my lady, or whether we go over to your honour, and I'm sure that there will be considerable opposition to that, because it will look like coming down a peg or two. Um, as far as the Lord Lady is concerned, yes, um, in the High Court, they had got round to calling us my lady in court. If they noticed... <laughs> <laughs> now, you would think, in the family division of the High Court, which is where I spent most of my time sitting, where we don't wear robes because we sit in chambers, you might, as an advocate, when you walked in through the door, at least pay attention to whether it was a woman sitting up there or a man, and get it right. <laughs> but the number of times counsel, head down, eyes on brief, looking at something else, would say, uh, well, this is the situation, my lord, and this is, my lord, what we'd like you to do. Um, um, they didn't like it if I said, mm. yeah, I think I prefer to be addressed as my lady. But, uh, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, they got it right. But in the Court of Appeal, the statute says that they, look, the justices in the Court of Appeal shall be styled Lord Justices of Appeal. Because when they invented them, 
it hadn't crossed their minds that there might ever be a woman. And when they consolidated the legislation in 1981, it hadn't crossed their minds that there might ever be a woman, even in 1981. The first woman was appointed in 1989, and I was the second in 1999. Bad, isn't it? Um, but at least they had, the first one had achieved the fact that she could be addressed in court as my lady. But, and so when I came along, I was addressed as my lady. But the um, people who do the law reports still used to put Lord Justice Hale and Lord Justice Butler's loss because that was what the statute said the, the, the style was. Um, so we started making a fuss about that. But we had to get the Lord Chief Justice to write to the, law, the editor of the law reports and say, please, can we be Lady Justice in the law reports as well? Final anecdote about this extraordinary uh, thing. When I was appointed a law lord, there were three of us who started work on the same day. Uh, me, uh, Lord Brown, and Lord Carswell. Lord Brown and Lord Carswell are both in uh, both age and judicial appointment very senior to me. You know, people to whom I raise my hat. But it so happened that I was appointed before they were. You know, the vacancy that I filled was one that had been happened and my appointment had been announced. I was sworn in before then. And of course, therefore, my judgments came in order of seniority before theirs did, and so on and so forth. But the law reporters assumed that obviously because it was little me, I had to be the junior one, didn't I? So the law reports for the whole of the first year had me as the junior member of the House of Lords when I wasn't. Now, what's that for sex? That's unconscious sexism of a high order, is it not? Okay. Have I answered your questions? <laughs> Exceedingly well. Fully. <laughs> Justice Ginsburg, did you face uh, uh, similar uh, uh, activities or practices at the court uh, that you thought uh, didn't pay enough attention to issues of gender? I had a press it a predecessor, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who was the lone woman on the United States Supreme Court, the first and the only, for 12 years. And so she had taken care of most of the irrationalities by the time I got there, but there were a few that remained. Uh, for example, when I was appointed there was a renovation in the justice's robing room. They did it in high speed, and it was to create a women's bathroom in that space, equal in size to the men's. So that meant that the court staff, at least, had a view of how things will be one beautiful day. But think of Justice O'Connor, whose chambers are in the front of the building, having where, where the justices are conferring. She has to walk all the way back to her chambers. No one had given a thought about that. And then there was an episode, a, a letter, that both Justice O'Connor and I received from Dear Abby, and dear Abby said, I received a letter from a woman who visited the court with her husband. They wanted to get there early to be sure that they would have a seat, and they breakfasted in the court's cafeteria. And a man in time excused himself to use the facilities. When he came back, his wife said, that's a good idea before we sit for two hours listening to argument." And she was told by the police officer in attendance, the women's bathroom doesn't open until ma nine. And she was mortified. And she wrote an angry letter to Dear Abby. <laughs> then and Sandra and I both received copies of that letter. I called her and said, couldn't be. And she said, impossible. But you know, it was. <laughs> And it, why, why was it? Because it was tradition and nobody thought about changing it. It was changed immediately. <laughs> but there, this kind of unconscious adherence to tradition. To tradition. Um, 
But there was a justice, and I don't know which one, perhaps someone here does. A year before Justice O'Connor arrived on the court, said at conference, one day we will have a woman on this court, and we won't know what to call her. So let's agree that we are going to drop the mister before justice, and we will just be justice, and then when she arrives, it won't be a problem. So if you look at the Supreme Court reports for the year before Justice O'Connor came, you will see that it's no longer Mr. Justice Brennan, it's just Justice Brennan. Well, I wish we'd done the same. <laughs> because I don't think it crossed their minds when uh, Mrs. Justice Lane was appointed in 1965, I think it was, the first woman High Court judge. Um, that they should do anything other than expect her to be called Mrs. Justice. We had a big debate when I first became a High Court judge uh, because one of my colleagues, uh, I, I used my maiden name and she used her maiden name and she objected to being called Mrs. Justice Arden. In fact, it's, it's Lady Justice Arden as she now is. So she said, can't we all be just justice? And you can imagine a room full of 90 men and six women the 90 men voting on what the women should call themselves. <laughs> no chance. We're still Mr. and Mrs. Justice and Lord and Lady Justice and so on and so forth. We shall see what happens. But everybody's got a bathroom story, haven't they? <laughs> Isn't it amazing? We are also the judges of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. <laughs> now, yes. <laughs> You're way ahead of me. The, the Privy Council, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, is the final court of appeal for, was for the whole of the British Empire, including um, the American colonies, um, and uh, now for those parts of the Commonwealth that are not independent of, uh, of the United Kingdom, or those which, although independent countries, and some of them republics, choose to keep it. But that is a very small number of countries now. Um, Commonwealth judges come and sit from time to time, including the present Chief Justice of New Zealand, Dame Sean Elias. But there was no loo for the women uh, who sat uh, on the uh, Privy Council um, until a few weeks after I arrived, because when I first arrived, uh, the, the sort of registrar sidled up to me and said, terribly sorry, but we haven't yet got your bathroom ready. Uh, so you can use mine until... <laughs> Uh, until it's ready. But again, they haven't thought ahead. So we've all got bathroom stories. But it's now Brenda's privy in the privy. Yeah. <laughs> Lady Hale, let me ask you about the, the actual physical movement uh, of the court. So the House of the Law Lords have been located in the House of Lords. You'll be moving to a new uh, a building and you'll have a new title as Supreme Court. But as I understand it, your powers, your jurisdiction will not dramatically change or perhaps change at all. Do you think there is real significance to the movement to a new building that has something to say about judicial independence, or is it just happenstance that you'll find yourself in new digs? Well, when the government announced this, it was part of a raft of constitutional changes that were announced in 2003. And the spin that was put on it was that this would enhance judicial independence. The, the three things that were going to enhance judicial independence were the creation of a Supreme Court separate from Parliament, the introduction of a statutory judicial appointments commission so that uh, the commission would recommend appointments rather than the Lord Chancellor, in effect, being responsible for judicial appointments. And the third of the big changes was to remove the judicial role of the Lord Chancellor, um, I don't know how many of you know that until, well, 2005 when it all came in, the Lord Chancellor was both the Speaker of the House of Lords, the equivalent of the Minister of Justice in the government, and a very senior government minister, and the head of the judiciary. Now, of course, in the great big British way, this worked perfectly well. And... When this was announced as enhancing judicial independence, 
all sorts of people who'd been very high up in the English legal system, the British legal system, said, but this is going to be an attack on judicial independence because the judges will no longer have somebody at the heart of government fighting their corner. They will no longer have somebody in, in cabinet saying to the prime minister, you can't do that because it will attack judicial independence, it will be contrary to the rule of law, and so on and so forth. So this statute, the Constitutional Reform Act, actually had to start with a great declaration saying that nothing in this act, no, this act does not adversely affect, A, the existing constitutional principle of the rule of law, or B, the Lord Chancellor's existing constitutional role in relation to that principle. And the Lord Chancellor has to swear an oath that he'll uphold judicial independence and do X, Y, and Z. But only in Great Britain could it be that the removal of a cabinet minister from being head of the judiciary and entitled to sit as a judge, though he never did, was seen as an attack on the independence of the judiciary rather than the other way about. The answer is, of course, people go on the way they go on, and it's what people do rather than the institutions that matter. Um, and we are independent as members of the House of Lords. Uh, we do our job independently of the parliamentarians, albeit in the same building. We do it in a different way from the way they do it, different times from the way they do it. They don't influence us, at least theoretically or in practice at all. The only thing that is a bit influential is you are surrounded by politicians all the time. They're in the same building. You know, they're having dinner in the same room if you have dinner there. They're having tea in the same room if you have tea there. Um, you get to know a few of them and you start having little conversations and, and, and so on and so forth. So you do feel, although we play no part in the parliamentary process, you do feel a bit involved. And my own personal view is that the better the House of Lords gets at being a second chamber of our parliament, and in my view it is getting better, because since they kicked out most of the hereditaries, it's got much more political, um, and it's much more evenly balanced in party political terms. So it is getting better at that job and flexing its muscles. The worse it is for us to be still even in the same building. I mean, I feel that very strongly, but I know many of my colleagues don't feel that. Justice Ginsburg, uh, your magisterial building, which you said was, I think, opened in 1935, one of the, the New Deal buildings built in the city. Um, for many years, uh, the court was located, I think, in the basement of the Senate in the, in, in, in the, uh, in the Capitol. Do you think the movement of the court to its own building was a statement or has been a symbolic statement uh, to the American people about the independence of the judiciary? Has that been a, an important move? It was meant to emphasize that we have a government of three co-equal branches, and when one was housed in the other, some might have the sense that the judiciary was not fully equal to the branch in which it was housed. So that was one reason for the move. The other was to have more spacious quarters. Now, I'm told that one of the advantages of your new building will be that you will be able to have law clerks with your space is rather cramped in the Lords. So is is that, in fact, the case? Will you, will you adopt the practice of having law clerks? We will have more space. Um, there will be space for us each to have one. We call them legal assistants. And they don't do exactly what law clerks do. Um, so each of us could have one were we to want it. At the moment, we have four between the 12 of us. Um, which is fine. And some of my colleagues don't use them at all. Uh, most of us, if we use them, I mean, they basically have two jobs with us. One is to write summaries of the petitions for leave to appeal. Um, they don't make any recommendations. They don't express any view on the merits. They simply write a summary. So that those of us who don't actually want to read the petition and the judgments in the courts below uh, don't have to. But we always do. And that's one thing they do. And the other thing they do is do whatever we ask them to do um, <laughs> in the way of research and so on. 
But mostly, um, I, I use mine for helping me with all the lectures and articles that I write. In other words, my sort of non-judicial duties. Um, because it's easy then to say to somebody, go and research this for me or find out all the cases and then you know, we'll have a chat about it and so on. Sometimes we talk over the cases with them, but very rarely, really. And they never, ever, ever write our judgments. Never, ever. Um, we would all of us regard it as quite wrong to do that. Sometimes we talk to them. About <laughs> <it>. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know how much that differs from the role of a law clerk here. Uh, but I think it'll be a very long time before we develop the role uh, in, in a more decision-making or even advisory capacity than it currently is. Let me add a, a PS to yeah. the move, the, the Supreme Court's move into its own quarter. Some people think that it had a downside, and the downside was just what you expressed about occasionally running into members of the legislature at lunch or some function in the building, the exchange among the legislators and the judges, some thought was a very healthy thing. And when the court moved out to its own quarters, that that rapport began to change, that something was lost as a result of, of the separation. I know there are colleagues of mine who, who do feel that. Um, and one has, has said uh, to a researcher, uh, because as a top court, your role is inevitably, to some extent, lawmaking. Uh, and to be in touch with the legislature gives you some sort of sense you know, of the momentousness of what it is that you're doing. Whereas if you're sitting in a bubble in a courtroom, you know, just, just discussing the arguments, uh, you might be a bit tempted to go rather further than was actually um, sensible or rational or justifiable um, there with your judicial uh, lawmaking. I don't myself, I think that's a matter of, of one's approach to the judicial task rather than a matter of physically where you are. But he has said that. May I ask one question about... Uh, You're not getting a word in any It's all right. <laughs> You mentioned the use of the legal assistance as the equivalent of what we at the U.S. Supreme Court would call the search pool. That is, the law clerks will summarize the petitions and the briefs in opposition, if there are any, and give us a concise description of what the petition is about. We have, I think, well, we have people from this court here who can correct me, but it's about 8,000 petitions for review each year. And from those, we nowadays hear not more than 80. And so this, the cert process is the way we winnow the number of requests that come in down to the small number that we actually hear. And for the most part, the mandatory jurisdiction of the Supreme Court is gone. Almost all the cases we hear are self-inflicted wounds. <laughs> How does the process work? Are there must-decide cases for the law lords, or is everything also discretionary? Um, the present senior law lord put it um, in this way when he was Lord Chief Justice rather than Senior Law Lord, that the House of Lords dines a la carte. Uh, in other words, yes, we do pick and choose the ones that we want to, uh, to have, uh, usually the things that we think most toothsome on the menu. Um, but uh, third, all cases, with an exception, but with one exception, all cases require to have the leave either of the Court of Appeal or of the House of Lords. The Court of Appeal can force a case upon us by giving leave. 
they hardly ever do it. Usually they, o they only do it because they think that we're going to... Oh, yeah. We had a recent example of a case where the Court of Appeal was bound by its own previous authority. It thought that authority was probably wrong and certainly questionable and, and that we would undoubtedly want the case. And so they granted leave. And do you know, by a majority of three to two, the House dismissed the appeal much to the disappointment of the Court of Appeal, which had actually wanted us to put the law right. No prizes for guessing whether I was in the three or the two. Uh, very sore point, that case, that particular case. The only exception, um, the cases that really we don't pick and choose, are appeals from Scotland, because there is no requirement for leave to appeal in a Scottish case. And uh, it only comes to us if two counsel have certified that it's a fit case for the House of Lords. And we do actually get some cases from Scotland that we shouldn't have. Now we could debate what sort of cases should we have. And <laughs> Hill, the, um, in in uh, um, the minds of most Americans, judicial independence is linked with the idea of uh, judicial review, the power of the Supreme Court to strike down uh, a federal and state statute as unconstitutional. This is not a practice pra that is not practiced uh, in, in the United Kingdom where notions of parliamentary sovereignty and supremacy, I guess, have prevailed for many hundreds of years. There have been some changes, however, through the United Kingdom's uh, uh, joining the European Union. Um, and I wondered if you would say a few words about what parliamentary uh, uh, supremacy means in the UK at this point and what role the courts are playing. Are you moving more towards the American model uh, of judicial review in some respects? The short answer, which I won't give, is yes, um, but only in some respects. Uh, we have, of course, got a bit of a federal structure in the United Kingdom now because we have devolved parliaments in Scotland and, thank goodness, touch wood, in Northern Ireland. And so, of course, we do have a jurisdiction um, to hold that the acts of the devolved um, governments and legislatures are ultra vires. So we have judicial review in a conventional federal judicial review sense uh, there. Um, judicial review of the acts of the UK Parliament does arise in relation to the European Union. That's the European Economic Community, because if an act of the UK Parliament is inconsistent with a directly effective piece of European Union legislation, uh, we have to ignore it. We have to try and either interpret it so as to be compatible with it or to disregard it. Uh, we don't say it's null and void, we just ignore it and get on with doing what, what the higher law tells us to do. Um, now, the higher law is usually at a very high level of detail, so it's not difficult to work out what we're supposed to be doing. So to that extent, it's not exactly judicial review, but it means that we bypass it. As far as human rights is concerned, um, if we find uh, an act or a provision in UK legislation is incompatible with the rights in the European Convention on Human Rights, we've got two choices. One of which is to interpret the incompatibility away. We have a duty to try and interpret all legislation as far as is possible to be compatible with the Convention rights. And I can, I can give you a very strong example of that. Would you like one? Um, very recently. Um, in anti-terrorism cases, we have something called control orders, which are preventive orders currently falling short of detention and imprisonment, aimed at controlling the activities of people suspected of um, being terrorists, uh, but aren't being prosecuted. Uh, and the judicial control of these orders uh, is premised on the notion that the judge will know everything that the Home Secretary who made the order knew. It's full disclosure to the judge. But that the statute provides that the judge has to ensure that 
this material is not disclosed to the controlled person uh, if it would be contrary to the public interest to disclose it, mainly national security interest to disclose it. Uh, instead, a special advocate is appointed for the, the controlled person who does have full access and can try and test the material, can try and um, get it redacted or gisted so that the controlled person can see more of what's going on, uh, try to get them to say, well, you don't really have to keep the secret, and so on and so forth. So that's the system. But the bottom line under the statute was that if you couldn't um, really have a proper testing of this order uh, without disclosing this stuff to the controlled person. Nevertheless, you could still make the order if you were satisfied that it was justified. Well, we have interpreted that to reverse effect. We have said that um, you can't withhold material if the withholding of the material would mean that the controlled person did not have a fair hearing, despite everything that you'd done to try and make it fair. Um, you can't, you, you will have to order the Home Secretary to disclose it. The Home Secretary then has a choice. They either disclose it or they withdraw the, the application for the order. So we have managed to interpret that provision by the insertion of the words, unless to do so would mean that it was an unfair trial. So that's one thing we can do. Uh, and the other thing we can do is declare the legislation incompatible, which has no effect on the validity of the legislation uh, but means that we think that if the case is taken to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, Strasbourg will find that it's incompatible, so the UK will have to do something about it and pay damages and all sorts. Um, so we're saving them the bother by telling them that we think it's incompatible, and usually they do something about it. In fact, they have so far always done something about it, because we told them that it was incompatible to lock people up indefinitely without trial on suspicion of being terrorists, we told them that was incompatible. Um, that was because they only did it to foreigners, you understand. Um, these are unpopular people called foreigners. We can lock them up. Um, but we'd better not take the risk of doing it with our own nationals. Uh, and we told them that they couldn't do that. And to their credit, they didn't renew that legislation and introduced the control order legislation instead. So those are the two ways. Sorry for the complicated answer, but it is complicated. It's not a simple matter of just saying the statute's void. I'd like to ask a follow-up question on the, the last point you just made. I think you're talking about the Belmarsh decision, that you don't hold people without charges indefinitely. But I understand that the government, following that decision of the Lord's, put the same people under a very severe form of house arrest. Is that continuing, or did the case come back to the Lords on the question of the house arrest? Yeah, the same. Yes, they, they, um, they did away with the indefinite detention provision and produced these things called control orders, which can range from just stopping you leaving the country and handing over your passport to house arrest. There's a whole range of things you can do under control orders. And control orders can be imposed upon both nationals and foreigners. So the discrimination went. The irrationality went. Um, and we had, as long as, uh, along with the case that I was just describing about the process for imposing control orders, we had a case about uh, the severity of the house arrest. Um, and the government had, the, the most severe orders that the government had made were 18 hours inside your house, um, along with a whole series of other things like having to have all your visitors vetted, um, being kept within a particular area if you left the house, having to clock in and clock out of, of, of the house, uh, and one landline and no internet access, and no mobile phones and all those sorts of things. So a fairly severe cutting off from the outside world in, in any event. Uh, because, of course, nobody was going to have any visitors, were they? If you knew somebody who was under a control order, house arrest, because of their associations with people who were thought to be terrorists or to be terrorist organizations, would you apply for permission to go and visit them? <laughs> no, I think not. Um, unless you could have a jolly good excuse, you know, 
that, that have nothing to do with potential links. Uh, so we, ha we had this series of cases. Um, they'd, they'd held 12 hours, house arrest was all right. Because basically, the length of time you're confined to the house is, is the, really the litmus test, because all the other things um, make it worse. But it's, it's really how long you're locked up for, even if the lock is at a distance. Um, they said 12 hours is all right. Um, and the lower courts have said 18 hours is too much. So it comes up to us. By a majority of three to two, we say 18 hours is too much. Uh, and two of the three say, and we're not going to express any opinion about what's all right, except that 12 hours in the particular circumstances was all right. We're not going to say. But the third one of the three said, but I think 16 hours is all right. So, of course, the government has taken the message that if you put together the two who thought 18 was all right with the one who thought 16 was all right, they can get away with 16 hours. So I don't know whether it's going to come up again. We'll see. But that's, that's what's happened. Let me ask the, other, the question the other way around to you, Justice Ginsburg. Um, as Lady Hale has said, the, the role of international law has brought the UK system a little closer to a sense of judicial review in particular circumstances. On your court, there's been an ongoing, let's say, discussion among the justices and some of the opinions about the relevancy of international law norms as you interpret statutes and the Constitution. Do you see a greater willingness to consult international norms these days on the court? Is this a trend we're likely to see more of in the court? Well, first, I think we have to distinguish international law, which is part of the law of the United States, always has been. John Marshall spoke to that eloquently. So international law is law that's binding on the United States. Think of all the treaties that we have with other countries in the world. Those are binding. The debate, and it really isn't, uh, in my mind, a, a terribly serious debate, is about foreign law as opposed to national law. If I think that the decisions, say, of the Supreme Court of Canada or of the Lords uh, can be instructive, is it permissible for me not to refer to them? Of course I can do that. But to acknowledge openly that I have referred to them and, and include a, a citation, well, to me, that's a no-brainer because I can cite anything that's in any law review in the world, I can cite a piece of student research, for example, and that's considered perfectly proper. Now, why in the world, if I can cite any law review comment, can I not cite to the speech made by Baroness Hale in, say, the Belmarsh case? Which I think I did on uh, one occasion. <laughs> So it's, of course, foreign law, unlike international law, is not part of our law. It's in no sense binding on us. But there are brilliant jurists all over the world, and they are speaking to common issues of fairness, equality, and we all have something to learn from each other. Frankly, for so many years, when the United States was really the only country involved in judicial review for constitutionality, other countries looked to the United States as models when they began to develop judicial review for constitutionality. And we kind of liked that, that other countries were looking to see what we did. More and more, I am persuaded that if we don't listen to others, if we think that what they say about a question that comes up in our system too, if we think that's irrelevant, our decisions will become increasingly irrelevant. Much better to have a healthy conversation among courts than to simply say, I will stay in my own little island and I don't have anything to learn from the rest of the world. Do your judgments, Lady Hale, uh, look to uh, 
foreign materials from other court, high courts as well? Yes, we do. And of course, I really do come from a little island. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, it's a little island who, whose legal system has a lot in common with the legal systems of really rather a lot of the world. Uh, so, of course, we have uh, a lot to learn from what's going on in, in other countries. Uh, I have to say, we probably pay more attention these days to what's being said in Canada and New Zealand and to some extent Australia, but of course Australia's constitutional position, they don't have a Bill of Rights in Australia, so um, although they do have constitutionality, uh, they have to invent it out of you know, the, the institutions of the Constitution to a much greater extent than countries which have a Bill of Rights have, have, have to do it. But we do find their judgments obviously have got, tend to have rather more in common with the issues that we've got, um, partly because, again, the, the Canadian Charter um, and the New Zealand Bill of Rights are rather more like the European Convention than your own Bill of Rights for obvious reasons. They, they come along uh, after the European Convention was drafted. Um, but we also, of course, pay attention to what's going on in the Supreme Court of the United States. In fact, I'm quite sure that I cited something from it in a judgment that I wrote only the other day. Yeah. Let me turn to questions from the audience. Want to raise their hand? You'll have to speak in a loud voice. Sir? Uh, Lady Hale, you said there's 12 law commissioners? No, no. Law lords, but you were talking about votes of three to two. Do they not sit together? Right. Um, we, for most cases, we sit in panels of five which means that we can sit two courts at once. And usually, uh, one court is the House of Lords hearing U United Kingdom cases, and the other court is in the Privy Council hearing Commonwealth cases. But in fact, the Privy Council work is diminishing, and the House of Lords work is increasing, and so sometimes we have two House of Lords panels. Could the outcome be a function of which five sit? Yes, undoubtedly. Um, so another question would be who picks the panels? Uh, of course, it's a, it is a, we, we, it's a very interesting question. If you sit on bank, it depends who picks the bank. And there may be a considerable pressure to get the court you want. With us, no politician could, could pack the court, really, because there's still the panels, uh, which uh, mean, mean that the, the politician would have no effect over the panels. The panels are actually selected by, in practice, the chief judicial clerk, who is not a lawyer. Uh, he's a, a clerk in the House of, uh, of Lords. And he picks the panels basically with a view to having some people who know something about the subject on it, uh, and what I always call police persons. You know, you, you need good lawyers who aren't necessarily steeped in the particular subject to, to be able to say to the people who are steeped in the particular subject, you cannot be serious. <laughs> that cannot be the law in your area. And, 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 and to introduce a, a, a different perspective. So there's a certain amount of horses for courses and a certain amount of trying to get a balanced panel. Um, and then the senior law lords uh, okay it and may, you know, may do a bit of adjustment. So there's no political influence in it. It's all done within the court. But yes, it does. The case I feel so strongly about, I have no doubt that had the panel been different, the result would have been different. Is there a possibility for the full say all 12 or 10 of you to sit when, when the question is very important or when there seems to have been a division between panels? Yes, um, in, in both. We, we, we can sit, we've, I don't think we've ever sat 12 or 11. We've, we've basically got to sit an odd number. Um, imagine our sitting 12 and then our being half a dozen of one and six of the other. That will be a bit frightening. Um, so, uh, and we've never sat 11, but we have sat nine. 
Um, we've sat nine, at least I've sat on a panel of nine twice since, um, but I'm, was, I'm sitting on a panel of nine twice this term. Um, the Belmarsh case was a panel of nine. We did actually think that was a hugely important case. Um, and when we first discussed it, we were 5-4. But when we actually finished our discussion, we were 8-1, which is quite interesting. Um, we also sat, sorry, three times. We sat nine in a very unusual case where we were asked to decide that an act of parliament was invalid. I could explain it but it's quite complicated debate. But we were asked to say that an act of the UK Parliament was not an act of Parliament because it had been passed through the procedure which allows acts to be passed without the consent of the House of Lords. This was the ban on hunting with dogs. <laughs> the two subjects that get most interest in the United Kingdom, I think one can say, at least in Parliament, are hunting with dogs and the other one is beating children. Um, then everything else gets much less interest. Uh, but there we are. So that was. So we were nine on that case, uh, and we were also nine on a case about provocation, where the Privy Council had reached one decision about what amounted to provocation, and the House of Lords had reached another decision about what amounted to provocation, uh, and so it was thought we better try and resolve the debate. We sat nine, technically in the Privy Council. And we were five, four. <laughs> and so then the question arose, well, that's the Privy Council. So is it binding on the UK courts? Because technically the Privy Council authority is only persuasive on the UK courts. And there was a House of Lords authority to the opposite effect. But the Court of Appeal in England and Wales has said, yes, we're going to follow the Privy Council case. Okay. Sir? Um, Lady Hale and actually Justice Ginsburg, you could comment too. You mentioned, I, I believe, what you thought was an irrationality under the law that, that you had to deal with, and this had to do with uh, different rules of detention for citizens and non citizens. This is obviously a very important issue that America has been dealing with for a number of years, too. And, and my understanding, uh, limited as it is, is that in, in America that's that's quite acceptable that there are additional protections for citizens that aren't afforded to non citizens. Uh, under the under the law, uh, could you comment briefly on on why you found that irrationality or, or how it's being dealt with? Yes, um, the there are obviously respects in which it is possible to draw distinctions between nationals and non-nationals, principally about whether you let them into the country or, or not, and how long you let them stay, and the circumstances on which you make them go. Um, that's fairly obvious. But the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, the high contracting parties undertake to guarantee those rights to everyone within their jurisdiction. It's not limited to nationals, it's not limited to residents. Uh, it was never going to be limited to nationals, but there was a debate when they were first drafting it as to whether it should be limited to lawful residents. So it's everyone within the jurisdiction. And within the jurisdiction, obviously, undoubtedly means everybody actually on the soil of the United Kingdom. Um, the European Convention uh, guarantees uh, physical liberty, so you cannot detain people except on certain grounds and after due process of law, but mainly there are limited grounds on which you can do it, and they don't include suspecting terrorism among the grounds. Um, and, the, and the European Convention also says uh, you cannot discriminate in the protection that you give of these various rights on a range of grounds which include sex, race, national origins. Now you can fight about whether nationality and national origins are the same thing, but we decided that we would regard them as the same thing. And w so we said you can't do that. Uh, one of the reasons that we said, said you couldn't do it was, was that it was irrational, because we knew perfectly well that there were uh, homegrown suspected terrorists just as dangerous as those that they, wanted to, they were locking up. Um, uh, and so it was irrational to say, well, we can control the homegrown ones without locking them up, uh, but we can't control these, these foreigners without locking them up. Uh, and it was even more irrational because they said, well, if you're prepared to go, we'll let you go. And one of the people who'd been locked up was an Algerian, dual nationality, Algerian and French. 
We couldn't send him back to Algeria because he would be tortured there. So we couldn't deport him. We don't deport people for torture. That's another thing we don't do. Um, uh, but it was decided, of course, the French could be made to have him. <laughs> so he was put on Eurostar. You know this nice train that we have? <laughs> it's quicker to get from London to Paris on Eurostar than it is to get from uh, Washington to New Haven, I can say, on the Asila. Uh, um, and uh, so he was taken to Paris on Eurostar and handed over to the French security authorities who promptly let him go. <laughs> so... Pretty irrational, that as well. Uh, so, yes. yes. Um, was, every country makes a distinction between citizens and non-citizens. If any of you have traveled around the world lately, well, just take to the EU countries. You know that if you have an EU passport, you go right through. But if you have a U.S. passport, you may have to get on. Um, uh, a line that wins around. Um, but because the question was asked as though this is uh, that the distinction is ever and always applicable, I want to, everyone here to be reminded of what I'm sure you, you already know is that our Constitution, let's take the 14th Amendment, due process an equal protection clause say, nor shall any state deprive any person, not any citizen. And the choice of use, the, the word person was quite deliberate. And similarly, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So the United States Constitution surely recognizes the fundamental human rights of all persons, then citizens have certain rights because of their affiliation with the nation. Most basically, the right to vote. But certainly, the, the notion of due process and equality, those must be enjoyed by all persons and not confined to citizens. That would be my understanding of the um, U.S. Constitution, so I'm very glad to have it confirmed. <laughs> of course, see the word person and know it has meaning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if EU law or international law conflicts with British law, is that something that the new Supreme Court would handle, or is that something which would take precedence? Oh, uh, European Union law takes precedence. That's part, but as Justice Ginsburg was saying, that is because the UK is party to international treaties which created a separate legal order for the European community, uh, which has precedence, to the extent that it has precedence, if you see what I mean constitutionally, over uh, the national law, which is why if we do find a conflict, we simply have to ignore what the national law says and do what the EU law says. professional responsibility and ethics for each of you, uh, for Justice Ginsburg in America and for uh, Lady Hale in Great Britain. And I'll um, defer to you. <laughs> <laughs> when you say professional, professional responsibility and ethics, do you mean judicial responsibility or legal I would think you're more for practicing than practicing attorneys. Well, I'd say one thing, and I, I don't want to address the codes of ethics or particular canons, but to me, the highest obligation of someone in the legal prof profession is to recognize that you have training and talent that makes it possible for you to make more than a decent living, but also that equip you to make things a little better in your local community, your nation, and your world. That is to devote your talent not just to um, being the counterpart of an artisan, a 
bricklayer who does a day's work for a day's pay, but for someone who sees himself or herself as a true citizen of the community. And I think lawyers that don't do that, that don't give back to the community, that don't do service that will help make things a little better, that those are the people who are in greatest violation of what should be the ethics of the legal profession. I think I want to be a little bit more down to earth, although I entirely agree with what Justice Ginsburg has said. Uh, uh, the greatest challenges for the legal profession are actually to be honest. Um, and it's the first duty of a lawyer to be honest. Uh, and no, there's a, there's a, there are pubs in England called the honest lawyer. Uh, <laughs> Uh, with the message being that they're supposed to be few and far between. <laughs> uh, but uh, by honest, I mean, uh, if you're an advocate or a litigator, being honest to the court, which is the first thing a court needs of its advocates is that they can trust what they say if they say something. You know, they, they, you, there is a, a duty to the court um, uh, not to mislead the court not to conceal from the court things that the court should know. You can conceal from the court things the court doesn't have to know, that's fine. Um, you have to be honest in your dealings with the other side. That doesn't mean to say that you, um, again, tell them everything, but you mustn't tell them lies and you mustn't, um, you, mu you must be honest in your dealings with them. And above all, honest in your dealings with your client. And that's probably where the legal profession brings itself most into disrepute. Uh, by not being upfront with the client about the real risks involved in litigation or the real merits of their case or the, the real options in front of them or how much it's all going to cost them. It's a, it's a big subject, professional ethics. There's now rather a lot written about it, uh, but that's what it boils down to. In the back there. Well, I first wanted to thank you for this wonderful opportunity. It's really delightful. Um, and then second, I wanted to ask Lady Tail, uh, Dina Lenikoff had mentioned this new Judicial Selection Commission, a merit-based selection commission for the justices upon which the president of the court would sit. And I didn't know if it was in a leadership position that the president would sit, but that's unusual as compared to the U.S. model. In the U.S., as I understand it, the American Bar Association consults with the sitting justices when there's a Supreme Court appointment to be made. Um, and there have been historic models like Chief Justice Taft who really lobbied um, for appointment. But this is a very different model um, that's um, in the works. I'd be interested in hearing more. Well, of course, it, it's, it's brand new for us. Um, as, I, as I said, uh, and until our new system, the Lord Chancellor basically was responsible for, for choosing the judges. Obviously, how much personal input he had uh, depended on the level on which it happened. Uh, and there was always a huge amount of consultation. Um, the, the law lords, for example, it's technically the prime minister who makes the recommendation to the queen. Uh, but the prime minister does more or less what the Lord Chancellor suggests that the prime minister should do. And for the last couple of appointments, um, the Lord Chancellor had a meeting with all the law lords um, it, it, and where we were all invited to express a view both about the sort of person and about individuals. He will have had other meetings with the Lord Chief Justices and so on and so forth, but that's how he did it. No such thing as a kind of applications process or uh, uh, Certainly no independence in, in terms of other people saying, are you really sure you want to do it in that way? Um, uh, no application forms, no CVs, no, no, nothing sort of transparent like that. Um, now, the whole of the judicial appointment system has now gone over to a judicial appointments commission for each of the parts of the United Kingdom, um, which are trying to introduce some more uh, transparent 
methods of selection. And they're experimenting with how you, you know, define the necessary qualities, assess the necessary qualities, uh, and have a genuinely objective way of doing things. I'm sure it's the right way to go. And they've also got the duty of trying to increase the pool so as to make it more diverse, because you know, we're not a very diverse judiciary in the United Kingdom. Um, but there's a special selection commission for the Supreme Court, which is representative of all three jurisdictions in the United Kingdom. But yes, it is uh, chaired by the president and the deputy president of the new Supreme Court uh, are on it. Um, and I think that simply reflects the fact that the senior judiciary have always had a huge role in judicial appointments, and it's merely carrying on in practice the senior law lords have, already, have always been tremendously uh, influential in who got appointed. So in a way, it's, they've got, probably got a rather diminished role compared with that of the Lord Chancellor, who was, of course, head of the judiciary and senior law lord until he stopped being that, uh, by introducing these three other people, not all of whom have got, can be lawyers. At least one has got to be a non-lawyer. So... It, it, it could make a, a difference in, in that respect. At the moment, that a sort of shadow of that commission is choosing the new president of, in effect, the Supreme Court, because the present senior law lord reaches, unfortunately, the age of 75 this year, and so he won't be able to be the first president of the Supreme Court. We're all devastated about that, because we were, he was one of the prime movers in establishing the court, and he's a brilliant man and a wonderful judge, and we would all love him to be our first president, but unfortunately he can't be. But he is chairing the commission to choose his successor, which is quite interesting. <laughs> the sitting law lords, or will it will be a, a new well, it will be a new appointment? We don't know. There would be a vacancy that would be filled in any event. Yes. And the question is whether there will be two appointments or just one. Well, I don't suppose that I'm saying anything out of turn when I say that it is generally assumed that the two front runners are the present, the present Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, who was a law lord before he became Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales. Uh, and uh, the person who would be the senior law lord, the senior among the remaining law lords, taking into account all the people who are going to retire before the new court starts. I think that's what we think the choice mm -hmm. is between. Um, I, so neither of them are new boys, so to speak. Uh, I don't think it would be assumed that whoever was uh, appointed to fill the vacancies, because they would be junior to even such persons as I. Um, and uh, there might be people higher up who would be thought of as being appropriate. Just we shall see. It'll be very interesting. The, this system is dramatically different from our system, obviously, uh, with the sort of merit selection, the role of the justices in the selection. Um, I wondered if, if you would care to comment on that uh, system or talk a little bit about our judicial selection system at the federal mm -hmm. level. Of course, what's being described here is similar to how some of the states choose judges, obviously not at the federal level, where it seems to be increasingly politicized. Um, do you have any thoughts well, on that? There is a, a great man who once said, the symbol of the United States really shouldn't be the bald eagle. It should be the pendulum. And so sometimes we've gone through periods where judicial selection uh, has been a contentious matter. I had the good fortune, as did Justice Breyer, of being nominated at one of those halcyon times. If you watched my hearings, they are very boring because <laughs> there was Orrin Hatch was my big supporter. It was going through the motions, but there was really no adversity in, in that time. Also, I think Jimmy Carter, who, who was the president who changed the face of the U.S. judiciary by appointing women and members of minority groups in numbers when they were barely there before. But Carter occasionally appointed very good judges who happened to be Republican, for example, 
Cornelia Kennedy, who was appointed to the district court, to our, uh, our equivalent to your high court, uh, by a Republican president, and then elevated to the Sixth Circuit by a Democratic president. So there have been times when there has been a rapport between the parties, and that's when it's ideal. And I hope that we will get back to that bipartisan approach to judicial nominees. We think there is no politics in our appointment system. Um, I don't know the politics of most of my colleagues, if they have any. Um, but but I'm, I don't want to be complacent. <laughs> Saspir, our last question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I would like to ask um, what you both think is going to be the most important challenge that the new Supreme Court of the United Kingdom is going to face in the coming years as it tries to establish its legitimacy as kind of the newcomer on block. Well, all the things we've been talking about, you know, about uh, independence, quality, actually I think quality is what one hopes is, is the answer. You know, if, if we do good, wise things in important cases, that's how we um, establish ourselves as being, one hopes, the same court that the law lords have been and, uh, and no different. But on the other hand, we are getting more and more cases of, of a sort that, that the old law laws didn't used to get. You know, 30, 40 years ago, the law laws did mainly tax cases and big commercial cases and a sprinkling of other things, but that was what they mainly did. Well, we don't do a lot of tax cases now. We do very few big commercial cases. We're mainly doing public law of one sort uh, and another, and things with an international dimension. And all sorts of things leap out of the woodwork. I mean, I've talked about the Hunting Act case. Um, we've got a case this term um, where the relatives of British soldiers who were killed in Iraq want us to say that Article 2 of the European Convention, which is the one that says everybody's right to life shall be protected, it's not just everybody's got the right, it shall be protected, means that the, there should be a proper independent inquiry into the legality of the war. Now you can imagine that that's not going to be the easiest case in the world to handle. Um, and that's going to be a nine judge case. And there will be more and more of those. And the more we are the new institution and not the sort of old, cozy, protected institution in the House of Lords, I can see the more we are going to be under fire for the things that we do. Uh, so we're going to have to be very, very careful and good. Justice Ginsburg, concluding thoughts? I think you can take courage from what has happened in other countries where the judiciary became more uh, conspicuous. And, and I think of our neighbor to, to the north, Canada. Canada didn't have judicial review for constitutionality until in 1982 when they got their Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And that court, using the power of judicial review for constitutionality wisely, I think has gained the respect of jurists around the world. The law lords have such a good start. I mean, how many hundreds of years <laughs> have they been in the business? And we basically, we, we inherited our system from yours. But this, I think, is a very exciting time because we will be closer together in having in the UK, really for the first time, um, a charter of 
human rights that will be law for the courts to apply in everyday controversies and not just something celestial. Well, this has been an extraordinary, not an ordinary discussion here. I want to thank you both very, very much for coming. Lady Hale, Justice Ginsburg, thank you so much.